about a quarter of an underground tunnel. You may have heard or read about it. The way forward for our space scarce sunny island. So that together with building owners and developers, we can see what more can be done underground. Is down into the underground. In 2019, the Urban Redevelopment Authority attempted to create more space for us by coming up with an underground master plan. In this blueprint, the majority of us get to stay and work above ground in the light. But everything else is slated to go subterranean. I'm talking massive infrastructure, storage facilities and transport networks. In this episode, I go to the depths of the earth where few TV hosts have gone before to find out how our underground master plan is going and what it will take to make it a success. What on earth does the space beneath our feet even look like? Well, it turns out we don't even have to go underground to see. This is Little Quailin. It was once a quarry where rock materials were extracted for public housing and urban development projects. But in the mid-1980s, quarry operations ceased. And what's left behind are towering cliffs that lay our bedrock bare. Meet Dr. Yu Ka Win. He is one of the consulting geologists for many notable subterranean projects, including the ongoing Labrador substation construction. So Dr. Ka Win, uh, what is Singapore's bedrock made of? Singapore has two major types of bedrock. One is the igneous rock, second one is the sedimentary rock. Okay, the dark gala and black gala one is the cabrowing rock. The white color one is the microgranite type. They are the type of igneous rock. West and southwest of Singapore, we will encounter the sedimentary rock. Igneous rock is stronger and better than sedimentary rock. Okay. If you turn inside the igneous rock, this one is very strong rock, you need to escape it. Then your tunnel pulling machine must be strong enough to excavate and pull through your igneous rock. I see, so igneous rock good to build on top of, but yeah, the foundation. But more challenging to... Go for the tunneling and excavation. To break through our tough bedrock, we need this robust tunnel boring machine. It has enabled Singapore to accomplish many groundbreaking construction projects. Beneath our island of just 724 square kilometres, We have pedestrian walkways linking to malls and offices. Further down, there are pipes carrying gas, water and telecommunications networks to and from our homes. Between 15 and 50 metres, we have our MRT networks. Expressways like the Kalang Paya Lebar Expressway, which is also Southeast Asia's longest underground road tunnel. And just beneath that, at 55 metres, the Deep Tunnel Sewerage System. This expansive system carries used water to centralised water reclamation plants to be treated and turned into new water for mostly industrial purposes. And deeper still, more than 100 metres beneath our feet, where I'm not allowed in, are our two major caverns. The underground ammunition facility holds our military stockpile. Placing it underground saves us large tracts of land needed as a safety buffer for a typical explosives depot above ground. And finally, 130 metres down, there are the Jurong Rock Caverns, Singapore's deepest underground endeavour. The caverns stand as tall as a nine-storey building and can store almost 1.5 million cubic metres of petrochemicals. That's about the volume of 600 Olympic-sized swimming pools. By shifting crucial infrastructure underground, Singapore has created more space for our tiny city-state. But beyond that, some infrastructure actually operate better underground. Like these unsightly power cables. They used to hang overhead where they were prone to power outages and damage from falling branches and leaves. To overcome this, 
Singapore pushed power cables three metres below our roads. These cables have served us well, providing gas and electricity across the island, and it's largely uninterrupted thanks to regular maintenance. But here's the stumbling block. Maintenance work on the cables disrupts life above ground. To walk on just a portion of these cables, at least one road lane must be blocked for about two days, interrupting the flow of traffic. These cables were first laid underground in the 1970s. Being decades old means they need inspection once every three months. In fact, these cables that have a lifespan of about 35 years are now approaching the end of their lives. But they can't be powered down and replaced until new ones are laid and ready to go. Otherwise, the power supply will be disrupted for too long. To overcome this, Singapore's major power provider is turning to smarter solutions by digging even deeper. So, I'm going down. And down. And down, until I'm 60 metres underground. How deep is 60 metres? Well, that's about the height of a 20-storey building. Here is where you'll find power to the people. And I'm meeting someone whose work keeps the electricity running. Since 2018, he's got a whole new office. This does now basically house all the transmission cables from east to west, from north to south, to distribute the powers within Singapore. This is a fire protection trough. There's three power cables inside. Uh -huh. And there's also cooling pipes inside to cool the cables for safety. I can't open it now because this is a live cable. Why, why build a tunnel like this? So that it, when it comes to accessibility, it's easier to, to reach. For example, if there is a damage on, on this particular cable, uh -huh. you can come in straight away uh -huh. and do the necessary repair. If it's found buried on the road, you need to put up notices, submit to authorities, do the necessary clearances, bring in equipment to dig up the road. But the thing is, when you excavate, you don't just expose cables. You have also other services, water pipes nearby. So there's some needs for cautions and so that you don't damage other services as well. But if you compare to a cable that's laid in the tunnel, any time you can need to come in, whether to inspect, to install, to repair, or even upgrade. This tunnel project is one of the world's deepest electricity supply projects. It's fitted with lifts that allow workers access to the cables. About 500 kilometers of cables have been laid, filling up less than half the tunnel's capacity. This leaves room for expansion to meet Singapore's growing electricity demands in the future. We have been building underground for decades now. How much space do we still have left down there? What more potential does our subterranean world have? Before URA rolled out the underground master plan, they commissioned design and engineering firm Arab to conduct a global study to explore international best practices in underground space planning and management. Ten cities were reviewed over four years. And leading the study is Tan Yong Heng. Uh, in 2015, uh, in that benchmarking study, where did Singapore rank against the other cities in terms of underground use? Singapore actually was, was leading in terms of uh, underground transportation, particularly in Rio. We are just behind Tokyo. For road, we are behind Tokyo and Hong Kong. In terms of transportation use of the underground, we ranked quite high. However, for other underground space use, like for example, the underground pedestrian network, if you compare to Montreal, they are 25 times denser than us. If you compare to Tokyo, they are 10 times denser than us. Okay, wow, that's like quite a lot. Yep. We have learned uh, quite a lot from how they actually systematically uh, plan their underground space. For example, in Helsinki, 
They have developed their first underground master plan in the world. In Hong Kong, actually what we learned from them was uh, they have actually developed a more strategic suitability plan. They identified the location where it's suitable for the rock cabin to be developed and reserved that as a space for the master plan. I see. What, what, what are, do they plan to do in these cabins? It's really used as a um, space resource for future users. Our underground construction has been haphazard. Developments were ad hoc and on a first-come, first-served basis. And if we continue this way, we could run into serious problems. New construction works may risk colliding with existing structures. To prevent this, Dr. Victor Koo has been working towards cleaning up our underground act. So, Josh, this is a 2D plan of the subterranean ownership. So for underground, you need the uh, geological formation. So this is about the soil, soil type rocks. Uh, the second type of uh, information is uh, the ownership information of underground. The third type is a very important one, is uh, what are the features underground, such as pipes, uh, utilities, the MRT station, the tunnels. So the problems are these plants are captured and stored in silo systems. So the, the builders, the engineers will need to gather and get all these plans from the different asset owners. Some of them need to piece them together. There's also issue about scale. When the plans are in different scale, you can't just overlap. We are looking at a consolidated database uh, where once the underground is surveyed in 3D, uh, high resolution, high quality, and it could be uh, checked into a system uh, that can be shared with the rest of the industry. So here in Singapore, what is SLA doing to improve the situation? SLA, since uh, 2014, has been uh, developing the physical digital twin you know, for whole Singapore. You know, just like what you see on the screen here. The whole Singapore is mapped in 3D. The idea here is that we are able to link what is above ground and what's underground in the same environment. And that's important for integrated planning and integrated development. We'll show you some of the utilities and some of the ownership uh, data underground. Wow, we're zooming in. And you go all the way. Oh, we're underground now. Oh. This is a 3D point cloud data set of a trench or a hole that has been dug up in the past. So what exactly is a 3D point cloud? So you see here, this is a sample of a 3D point clouds that represent the trench or the hole. They are represented by points in 3D space. So points. actually there are billions of points here. Oh. If you zoom in, and when the points are colorized and they are so close with each other uh -huh. in this form, you actually see like it is like a model. Oh, look at that. <laughs> this is in 3D, you can measure the depth inside as you can see each of the pipe inside. And with this data set, uh, we can even bring this to site uh, using an augmented reality to show exactly where is this pipe on site, even though it's covered up already. Hopefully going in the future, so every trench that we dig up, we capture this kind of information and this information can be shared with other users mm -hmm. and you can reduce the digging of the road. Mm -hmm. It's time to map our underground in 3D. And to figure out the best way of doing just that is Rob Fanson. The Singapore Land Authority has commissioned a six-year assignment to his team. At the end of it, they would have recommendations on how Singapore can create and implement a central digital database of all subsurface utilities to facilitate future developments. Today, Rob has invited me to Bukit Burmai, where a new gas pipe is being laid. An open trench like this is a chance for Rob to test this device. This is a laser scanner that captures information point by point of everything in its line of sight. Eventually, the collection of points known as 3D point clouds will represent the 3D shape. What we're really trying to do is build a whole map for the whole of Singapore's underground. Wow, the whole of Singapore. This is not the only device you use to map the underground. 
So we're looking at these kind of devices, handheld devices that really enable uh, almost anyone to capture good data in a span of minutes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we want to resurvey or recapture that information. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we want to do that without actually excavating mm. uh, the, the ground. Mm -hmm. So for that kind of scenario, there are different techniques. We call them non-destructive techniques where mm -hmm. we typically scan into the ground, build a kind of CT scan, if you will. Unfortunately, there's not a single device that can capture everything in one go and, okay. and just give it to you in real time. It's going to be a long-term effort. We have to work with what we have and then slowly over time, by capitalizing on all these different opportunities that arise, newly built utilities, but also whenever we have the chance to map existing utilities, to capture that properly, mm -hmm. and then sort of bring it back into a consolidated map where we can then recycle that information, uplift the data quality, and then make it available for the next person again to use that data and again improve it over time. I've found out what it takes to map out all the space that we currently have underground. And next, we'll find out what we can do with it. When it comes to building underground, we know we need to map out our subterranean future. The question now is, what more are we planning to put down there? I'm meeting Jasmine Wu, the executive civil engineer from URA who helped develop our underground roadmap. We have discovered a win-win situation. By making innovative use of our underground space, we plan the above ground and underground space together uh, to achieve a desired um, urban experience. So how about our residential areas? What can we look forward to seeing in terms of above ground and underground usage? Uh, there are currently uh, infrastructure constraints in having underground developments within our existing built-up towns uh, because of the need to excavate. Uh, hence, our 3D underground master plan has been focusing on the three newer areas. And such construction is in progress. Tenga promises nature-centric neighbourhoods with pathways for walking and cycling and a town centre with no cars. That's because the roads will run beneath the surface. Also underground is an automated waste collection system. It uses a vacuum pipe network to collect household waste that is transported to a sealed container. Trucks then periodically collect the waste for disposal. Over the years, our reasons for our tunnelling underground have shifted from hiding crucial but unsightly infrastructure to creating more precious space above ground, and more recently, to enhance livability at surface level. Perhaps looking underground could be the answer to one more urban concern, high carbon emissions. A vibrant tech hub like Singapore requires more data centres. Data centers house servers that store, process, and communicate data produced every single day. Data centers enable us to send emails and instant messages. We can't stream TV shows and games without them or carry out e-commerce transactions. Our daily lives rely on data centers. But this year, Singapore imposed a temporary pause on new data centers because they are not sustainable. Data centres are a huge energy guzzler. They consume 7% of Singapore's energy. And by 2030, it is going to be as high as 12%. About 50% of energy consumption in data centres is used for air conditioning to keep the servers cool. But what if moving them underground is the solution? Sounds like a question for Wandril Dowserain. His goal as the head of one of Southeast Asia's leading data centre providers is to deliver sustainable data centres in the region. I'm supposed to meet him at the Tiong Bahru Air Raid Shelter, but before I go there, he's told me to do something first. I'm taking the temperature here. So, I've got a temperature outside already. What's next? 
Uh, how much did you have for outside temperature? Okay, it was 35. Oh, so here is 28. Wow. Uh, as you can see, uh, there is a huge difference naturally between outside and inside, so you need to cool underground less, so it's a potential um, um, savings on energy, mm -hmm. on CO2 emissions. Here in Singapore, we estimate that one degree Celsius variation will give you between two and five percent decrease um, in terms of uh, the energy that you need to put in to cool. That sounds like a no-brainer to me. So we should just go underground, right? So why haven't we done it? So today, just to give an idea, uh, the average size of data center in Singapore is between 20 and 30 megawatts. And to make this type uh, of uh, underground data center economical, we would go to at least 50, if not 100 to 200 megawatts. So it's very big in size. Has any other country successfully built or stored a data center underground? Let me just give you an example in Europe. It's in Finland, in Helsinki. There's one data center that is in a red shelter. This data center is completely free cooled uh, by the uh, coolness of the air. Building and maintaining underground infrastructure is no walk in the park. But by shifting our focus to utilizing our subterranean space better, we can improve quality of life for the space above ground. I'm standing on the perfect example. On the surface, this looks like just another park to underline Singapore's status as a green city. Picturesque and peaceful, but every feature on this rooftop garden is also practical. A large green space the size of three football fields is a great spot for picnics. But that's not why we're here. This water feature is a hint. It actually isn't just decorative. It's a moat that protects what's really happening underneath. The world's first dual moat desalination plant. The Keppel Marina East desalination plant can produce about 30 million gallons of fresh drinking water per day. Enough to meet the demands of about 200,000 households. This desalination plant was first envisioned as a three-storey building above ground. Instead, it's a single-storey building underground. Using advanced technology, engineers managed to shrink the space required for desalination processes, which optimizes the use of space underground. We used to think that the final frontier was up above. The space race was our only future. But Singapore's future might be a way to fill the space down below. And that's why it matters. <laughs>